What matters to you? It's a different question than what makes you happy, according to our guest today, whom I will introduce in a moment. Happiness stems from what really matters to the individual, and many of us have lost our collective understanding of what matters means. But it's not too late. There's hope for our youth, and there's hope for the rest of us. Finding out what matters to each of us is a very personal journey. To be seen, heard, and valued so that each of us becomes a valued member of society and can give back is the essence of understanding what matters and in turn guides us in seeing others and encouraging the concept of mattering for them. Each of us has a uniqueness that once we intrinsically honor that, we are able to then actualize that and share our uniqueness in a positive way to others. However, when that is never offered or taken away through making us feel invisible, basically that we don't matter, we make choices that can hurt us and society. I recently had the privilege of attending my son Tyler's graduation from Oregon State University and was deeply moved by the commencement speaker, Charity Dean, the recognized public health physician who has been commended for her work in predicting the danger of the COVID-19 pandemic very early. She not only shared her incredible story of determination, perseverance, but most importantly, her sense that she mattered in the face of an environment that had low to no capacity to see her, basically where she and how she was raised. She talks about the ability to write one's own story. And there are often, or maybe always, forks in each of our roads where there are decision points, what she calls a version number one and a version number two. We choose what version of our story that then unfolds. This is particularly challenging when we face what feels like insurmountable barriers. Given the opportunity to be in an environment where being seen and heard matters to those around us, meaning our parents, caregivers, teachers, partners, and friends, demonstrates to us the powerful lesson that we matter. If we matter, we can truly be global citizens because we not only live a life that is meaningful because we matter, we recognize the importance of seeing and hearing others as they matter too. It sounds so simple, but it takes paying attention and putting our adult agendas aside. Not easy to do as we all have them, whether for our own offspring or anyone we are mentoring, while we truly listen to them and what matters to them. Recognizing the importance of what matters can be taught, ideally when we are young and in an environment that is conducive to truly being present and enabling our younger generation to feel seen. However, mattering is important to everyone, and I'm guessing that my guest today would agree that being seen and heard is also important for all of us as adults. Welcome to Small and Gutsy, our podcast featuring nonprofits and social impact organizations under $10 million. My name is Dr. Laura Whitkoff, and I'm excited and proud to be your host. We hope you'll love the stories as much as we do, and perhaps you will find needed services, a job, volunteer, invest in, or donate. And for all of you followers, Small and Gutsy has just been granted nonprofit 501c3 status. We are thrilled to have moved in this direction, enabling us to continue to meet our vision of interviewing as many smaller nonprofits and social impact organizations as we can. So please pass along any valuable information you hear today to others and send me the name of any organization you'd like featured at lwitkoff at gmail.com. That's two T's and two F's. So why does this matter? Pun intended. Many studies have linked social media use to poor mental health outcomes, especially among younger people. A 2019 systematic review published in the International Journal of Adolescence and Youth found that excessive time spent using social media was associated with depression, anxiety, and psychological distress. A 2018 University of Pennsylvania study published in the Journal of Social and Clinical Psychology found that college students who limited social media use for three weeks showed significant reductions in loneliness and depression compared to those who had unlimited use. It's really interesting because we love social media and we use it, but to what extent does it really harm us? Some form of social media use, particularly Facebook, Snapchat, and YouTube, were linked with higher levels of self-reported depressive symptoms, according to a 2021 study in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, which surveyed over 5,000 individuals. 
And I want to give you a few more data points. According to the World Health Organization, globally, one in seven 10 to 19 year olds experience a mental disorder, accounting for 13% of the global burden of disease in this age group. Depression, anxiety, and behavioral disorders are among the leading cause of illness and disability among adolescents. Suicide is the fourth leading cause of death among 15 to 29 year olds. The consequences of failing to address adolescent mental health conditions extend to adulthood, impairing both physical and mental health and limiting opportunities to lead fulfilling lives as adults. That's why I think this truly matters, not just for youth, but for all of us. Look, we all know COVID-19 didn't help and probably fast-tracked this fallout, which was happening anyway. If COVID did anything, it highlighted and pronounce the issues where we now can make decisions about how to address them for our youth and ourselves. The Mattering Movement, created and spearheaded by an incredible dynamic foursome, one of whom we will meet shortly, is my guest today, Jennifer B. Wallace, Chief Mattering Officer, and I just love that title, is an award-winning journalist and author of the new book, Never Enough, When Achievement Pressure Becomes Toxic and What We Can Do About It. I love that there's a piece about what we can do about it. She is a frequent contributor to the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post and appears on national television to discuss her articles and relevant topics in the news. She's a graduate from Harvard College and began her journalism career at CBS 60 Minutes, where she was part of a team that won the Robert F. Kennedy Award for Excellence in Journalism. She is a journalism fellow at the Center for Parent and Teen Communication at the Children's Hospital Philadelphia. Jennifer serves on the board of the Coalition for the Homeless in New York City, where she currently resides with her family. Her fellow founders also need to be mentioned, although they couldn't be guests today on Small and Gutsy, and I think then that would be an episode that would probably be about four hours because there are, it's incredible. She's an incredible team. CEO Dr. Sarah Benison is an educational leader, activist, and founder of Trinity School Office of Public Service, a thought-leading service learning initiative engaging students, faculty, families, and alumni in ongoing meaningful community engagement work and social impact curriculum. Wow. Dr. Benison is also the founder of a children's sleepwear company for social good, Benison Gives, which emerged from work she was doing to support infant and maternal health in Burundi, East Africa. Chief Creative Officer Kim Towner is a seasoned entertainment executive known for developing creative talent, content, and retail initiatives across consumer product categories and varied distribution tiers. As the Schultz family executive in charge of the Peanuts movie, she led the brand relaunch strategy and execution worldwide to $2 billion plus in global retail and $250 million at the box office and a Golden Globe nomination for Best Animated Film. Her Peanuts by Schultz Animation series produced and distributed with France Television, which I'll probably mispronounce terribly, landed an International Emmy Award nomination for Best Animated Series. And finally, Chief Strategy and Operations Officer Kimberly Kravis, who has spent the past two decades supporting, advising, and guiding nonprofit organizations, especially as they progress through crucial strategic periods. She has served as Vice Chair of the Lung Cancer Research Foundation and Co-Chair of the Parents and Science Steering Committee at Rockefeller University. She has has held long-standing appointments at the Spence School, the Loomis Chafee School, and the Buckley School's Board of Trustees, and is involved with the Robin Hood Foundation. Along with these amazing founders, there is an entire team of experts, including youth, which in and of itself is very impressive. So... I want to just share with you something I pulled from their website, which I really appreciated and loved. The Mattering Movement answers the question, what can we do to combat the pandemic of loneliness and despair that are harming our youth? How can we combat today's widespread mattering deficit? I am so very excited to introduce my guest today, and I'm going to shift it to her more colloquial name, Jenny Wallace, who will share her passion on mattering about which I cannot wait to hear as I believe this might change my life for the better as it already has. As I told you before we started recording, Jenny, I constantly ask myself when I'm faced with something you know, something that is disappointing or something I'm upset about is I say to myself, does this really matter? Like what really matters to me? And it has changed my frame already. And we haven't even had the interview yet. So, and I haven't read your book. (laughs) That is so exciting. So tell me what drove this passion? I know you have this long history in journalism. You've seen a ton of 
despair through your own work as you look at youth. And I just, I, I really want to understand the turning point for you into wanting to create what I would consider would be a global movement for everyone where we start to pay attention to what really matters. Yeah. So, well, thank you for that amazing introduction. I am so happy to be here talking with you about this. I I will say mattering has changed your, you know, has changed your perspective. Mattering has changed, completely changed my life. Um, it has become uh, my North Star, both in my work and in my relationships with family, friends, and strangers. To give you a little bit of background about how I got to the Mattering Movement, I've been a journalist for many years. And then in 2019, I also have three teenagers, and that's relevant for what I'm about to say. So mm-hmm. in 2019, I wrote an article for the Washington Post about two national policy reports, one by the National Academies of Sciences and another by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So two very you know, mm-hmm. important journals um, that our government you know, uses to create policy. They had listed the uh, most at-risk youth in our country today. You know, it was people that you would imagine uh, children living in poverty, children with incarcerated parents, children of recent immigrants, children living in foster care. And then there was a new group added to our most at risk youth. And it was a surprising uh, announcement. Um, it was students who attend high achieving schools, as, as called by the researchers. Those mm-hmm. are public and private schools around the country where. Um, you know, the standardized test scores are high and the academic order offerings are varied. And, um, and these students are now two to six times more likely to suffer from clinical levels of anxiety, depression, suicide, ideation, and substance abuse disorder than the average American teen. So as a parent of three students, you know, going to these schools, I wanted to find out what was going on? What were the roots here? What could I do at home to buffer against it? I want to be clear that the students in the in these reports that they're talking about uh, as newly named at risk, we're not talking about the one percent or the top ten percent. We are talking about the top twenty to twenty five percent of household incomes, as one researcher put it, one in three students. Because they're in those environments. So they they aren't necessarily in that top 1%. The Surgeon General um, has also named this excessive pressure to achieve as a real source of mental health struggles. I sold this book proposal and then I, I went in search over the last four years of who were the kids who were thriving despite the pressures in the environment? What did they have in common? What was home life like for them? What was school like? What were their friendships like? What did the parents focus on at home? And I found about 15 or so threads that these healthy achievers had in common. And as I was looking for a framework to present my findings, I came across this psychological construct called mattering. And mattering has been around since the 1980s. It was first conceptualized by Morris Rosenberg, who brought us the concept of self-esteem. And what he found was students who Mm -hmm. had a healthy level of self-esteem really felt like they mattered, that they were significant and important to their families. Over the decades, mattering has, uh, you know, definitions have evolved. And the definition that most resonated with me um, is this idea of feeling, mattering as feeling valued by family, friends, and community, and being depended on to add meaningful value back to family, to friends, to communities. So the students I saw who were struggling the most either felt like their mattering was contingent on their performance. I only matter when. You're an extension of versus your own person in some way. Yep, got it. Keep going. Or Mm -hmm. the other group that seemed to be struggling were kids who felt like they were valued at home, but they were so focused on building their own resumes. They had no time in their schedule. No one relied on them. They lacked social proof that they mattered. So they might have heard the words, but there was no proof out there for them to see, oh, look, I make an impact, a positive impact on that person's life. Oh, I need it here. Oh, my voice is needed in this certain area. The kids who were doing the best, as I mentioned, had this high level of mattering. 
Um, it worked like a protective shield. It didn't mean that these healthy achievers didn't have setbacks and failures and they didn't have of course. moments of sadness and depression and anxiety. But what mattering did was it was like a buoy that lifted them up so mm-hmm. that they could you know, continue on and recover. It almost feels like the, the ability to have that shield is a form of resilience when faced with a challenge, because we all face challenges, right? So I love that because we think we're shielding our children. And in fact, we may sometimes be doing the opposite. Yes. Fascinating. And mm-hmm. I will say, when you say that it, it um, it's a shield to help with their resilience, what I have found in my research and what decades of resilience research show is that Resilience fundamentally rests on relationships. So Sonia Luthar, who recently passed away, was one of the world's leading researchers on resilience. And I interviewed her throughout this book. Her voice is everywhere. And I'm so grateful to have had such access to her. But she talked about how on this topic of resilience and relationships, how any child in distress, whether it's a child living in poverty or a child under this excessive pressure to achieve, The number one intervention is to make sure the primary caregiver, most often the mother, the primary caregiver that her well-being, her support system is intact because a child's resilience rests on a parent's resilience and the parent's resilience rests on the depth of their relationships. So do they have people in their life that see them, that, um, that they matter to? That is what gives us resilience. So it's it's in the relationship. Is that upon the interpretation of the individual, right? Because different things matter to each of us. So if I feel that I matter to someone in my community or my village, however I define that, that can be enough. Absolutely. It's how I define that. And that's interesting because I think what social media has done, and you'll probably speak to this more, is that it's broadened our community in a way that we're trying to matter in places where we don't even exist necessarily or need to exist. And that becomes a false sense of a village that really shouldn't be part of our community per se. Does that make sense? It does. I um, So where I come out um, when it comes to social media, and this is from dozens and dozens of conversations with psychologists, is I don't think social media, I know that there are scholars like Jonathan Haidt and a couple of researchers, at least, who are very vocal about this, that they think social media is the cause of the distress today. What I have seen in my conversations with hundreds of families and what I have seen by reading the research is that social media is a problem, but it is not the root of the problem. Yeah, that's The great. root mm-hmm. of the problem is this idea that I don't matter or that mm-hmm. I really question my mattering. And we live in a society, both adults and our youth, where we are made to question our mattering. That capitalism kind of runs on us questioning our mattering. All matter when I buy that car. All matter when I lose mm-hmm. the 10 pounds. All matter when mm-hmm. I live in the big fancy house. All matter when I get the big promotion, when I make the money. Um, and that is not what true mattering is. True mattering is not... Uh, rooted in these sort of external achievements that we are so tempted by. And it is so tempting, right? It's it's so tempting. Well, there's an addictive quality about it. Very, I think social much. media, and I agree with you and I totally hear you, is that it's a mechanism to further the concept of really not even understanding what matters to us. 100%. It's hard to then go back into that place and sit with yourself and sort of, because I love mindfulness, sit with yourself in a place of, okay, so what really matters to me? And for our kids to figure that out, because they are seeking approval oftentimes, is if they really understand that just who they are matters and they're discovering it and figuring it out is enough. But we as the adults around them have to make sure that that really comes to fruition for them on a regular basis so that they can combat all of the stuff that's outside. There are so many messages that our kids are receiving day in and day out on social media, in the classroom, from their peers, from their 
their peers' parents about who matters the most in our society. Mm -hmm. It's the people that get into the elite college. It's the people Mm -hmm. with the high profile jobs. Being famous is now a life goal for this entire generation. But really what that goal is, what they are saying when they say they want to be famous is that they want to matter. They want to be seen and valued. And unfortunately, what any famous person, and I know many, what any famous person will tell you is that there is no mattering when it comes to fame. What really, as we talked about earlier, is are the, the deep nourishing relationships of people who really know us, who know us and see us and love us flaws and all. I always love collaboration and building together. And because I think it's all, the outcome is always better. Oh, but it's totally interesting. Agree. We don't, we don't, teach that enough. I teach at USC and um, both the classes that I teach are always, there's always group components. And I always get students who go, I don't like to work in groups. I just want to do this on my own. And I think to myself, I, I get that it can be easier. You don't have to deal with personalities or management or any of that stuff. And at the same time, I firmly believe that's not what our life should be about. We don't do things alone, or we shouldn't. There isn't one thing that is really done alone. We have our personal achievements that we work on, but it's often within the context or almost always in the context of other people, either who have helped us or supported the idea or been a coach to us or any of that. And so I think sometimes the word ambition, I think we should redefine that. Well, I write an entire, uh, one one of my big aha moments of writing this book was the idea that you talk about with um, the, I call it interdependence, that the the goal of of American parenting, right, is to raise, you know, independent kids. And that is a worthy goal, right? I do want my kids to be able to go out there and support themselves and, you know, live and, and, um, but really there's a bigger goal that we want for our children. And that is a more profound goal. And that is to give them the mindset and the skills of interdependence, being able to rely on people in healthy ways and allowing others to rely on them. I think we don't serve our kids well when we, um, you know, when we play into the myth of our hyper individualistic culture. You know, interdependence is the way we have functioned, you know, from the very beginning. What I've worked on in my own home is to normalize all of the help I have received. Yeah, I love that because it not only demonstrates to your kids your humanness, quite honestly, and it demonstrates that you're not afraid to reach out when you need to, or that you're not afraid to receive when someone offers. It reminded me of um, the wisdom of... Edward Hallowell. I don't know if yes. you know his name. He's a psychiatrist. I do. He once wrote a book that I love, uh, The Childhood Roots of Adult Happiness. Talks about this, this idea of never worrying alone. And that to me is what I have created as the mantra of my own house. That worries feel so insurmountable, we are alone in them. And so what I have modeled you know, out loud with my kids, reaching out for help, reaching out, leaning to people. I want my kids to also lean on people. What do you do if you, if you're stuck, if you feeling bad about yourself, if you're questioning your own worth and value, don't worry alone. So that's sort of the number one rule in our house and that it feeds the interdependence mindset. I have, um, five kids, four are mine, and I adopted my husband's and, uh, son. And, uh, when my, second child was two, a little bit older than two. He is very high functioning, uh, has very high functioning autism. And he just got a master's in library and information science, actually. And so I was looking for a job out in LA. He wanted to move out to be closer to me, which is really great. He lived in New England. And I remember um, our sort of family mantra at the time 
was when he was probably a little bit older, so he might have been three or four, he got very frustrated because he had um, large muscle tone issues and he couldn't, his speaking was really tough. And so I, he would sit at our, you know, our dining room table, we'd have dinner and he would literally bite his hand because he wanted to say something and he couldn't get it out. And the conversation was going on and on. And so I remember stopping the conversation at dinner and I would wait until we figured out what he was trying to tell us. I didn't care how long it took. It could take 30 minutes. It never usually took that long. But I think it was my way of saying both to my other children, he matters. What he wants to say matters, which I never use that term. But that's what I think was sort of innately because I thought how frustrated is this child that he's trying to get the words out and can't. And it's not his fault. And how do we make it easier? But also, how do we make it a community thing? Yes, that is so profound. The the, um, your voice, even if you're having a hard time getting it out, we need your voice. But I wish I had in some ways, and I think I tried, continued that. I needed you many, many years ago because I'm much older than you are. My kids are all adults now. But I believe, and Jenny, I'd love your commentary on this. I, I believe that it is never too late to start this, no matter how, because we have people in our lives we mentor, but also for ourselves. So can you speak a little bit based on your research, and then I want to get back to your book a little bit, on how you see us shifting the way we think, because this is a movement and I'm all in. Oh, that's so great. Well, let me, let me give you a little bit about what the researchers say about mattering, whether we are young, old, rich, poor, the need to matter never goes away after the, you know, basic human needs of food and shelter are met. It is the need to matter that drives all of human behavior for better and for worse. So better when you feel like you matter, right? You show up positively in the world. You want to contribute, you want to give back, you want to be collaborative. You know, you you see a world of abundance. When you are made to feel like you don't matter, it can cause you to act out. Oh, you don't think I matter? I'll show you I matter. I'll show you. you Mm -hmm. A a school shooter is the most tragic example of that. Um, Mm -hmm. So if we know in our heads that all have this deep human need And for too many people, that need is going unmet. If we can see that in the people around us, if we could see that at the grocery store with cashier who's been yelled at by 10 people before you and whose boss threw her on a shift and she wasn't able to get childcare for her son. And you wonder why is, you know, why is the, why is this cashier? Why does she have no good customer service? Well, you know why? Because her mattering has been beaten out of her. So what can you do in that Mm -hmm. moment? You can see her humanity and you thank her for what she's doing and you can appreciate her. And we all have the time to do that, even if we think we don't, because it takes, I think personally, it takes more time to fight that and get what you need and be in this rush than to take that moment and sit and be responsive to someone else's needs in that moment. Absolutely. And invariably, whenever I've been in that space, I always have a great outcome. And I actually walk away feeling probably, I don't know, better than the other person or just as good. I mean, it's really quite remarkable when you start to do this or practice this. When you start to see that you can unlock unlock mattering in other people, it only feeds your own mattering. I know in your book, you, you have... Um, ideas and techniques because I've read pieces and um, and I can't wait to read the whole thing uh, cover to cover and um, but I, I want to know more about sort of your ideas and your team's ideas about how this is going to spread because I know it also uh, can work in organizations in every industry uh, in every neighborhood, in every family, in every interaction. Yes, uh, it, it is. Like we said, it is um, everyone uh, universally needs this need met. Um, so the book sort of focuses on um, this these high achieving youth, these these youth who are attending these competitive schools and how to fill their mattering. I've had so many early readers read the book and say, I need more, right? I, you convinced me. I want to lead a life of mattering. I've gotten the tips from my kids. I've gotten ideas that I could do at home, but I want more. That's where the mattering movement came to be because it's not just children who feel a lack of mattering. 
American adults are feeling a lack of mattering too. Retired people, that is a very hard transition. When, when children leave the home to go to college or to move out and go to their own apartment, there is a mattering void that's left over. So our mattering is, it's never constant over the course of life. It fluctuates. My long-term thinking is to give people the skills and the tools to, um, you know, to, to locate genuine needs in the world and to match their strengths with those needs so that they can have this like just well of mattering. So it's, so where I see it starting, you know, it started with the book and that's the tip of the iceberg with mattering, right? Our achievement culture, that never enough feeling, that, that never enough feeling is really this universal feeling. The nonprofit is starting with giving parents more tools. So there are tools in the book, but then we're giving them even more tools through the website. Um, we will be doing a speaker series with the you know leaders in the research on mattering to talk about practical applications. So we're first starting with with parents and children. We're also going into schools and starting something called the Mattering Project, where teachers can. And the reason we have so many youth student advisees is that love we want that. them mm-hmm. to run these projects. In- I love it. So it's real. It's exactly what should right? happen. So it's mm-hmm. led by them with a teacher advisor. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's mm-hmm. it's teaching them and giving them the school the skills to identify genuine needs. So it's not what do you want to do to give back. It's what actually is needed by the people in your community. That also is about taking control in a way of rather than making assumptions, mm-hmm, exactly. which I love that. Yeah, Dr. Mm-hmm. Benison, who, Sarah Benison, who's one of my co-founders, yeah. has this whole curriculum that can be used in schools to, to sort of foster cultures of mattering. So those are sort of the, that's sort of the first part. And then we're moving into mattering at work and mattering, you know, in midlife and beyond. And I think that we have to start thinking about retirement, not just do we have enough money in the bank, but do we have enough mattering? Um, and how can we keep our mattering account full when it's not as obvious, you know, where we could go to fill up that mattering tank? We're looking also to give resources to retirement communities and people who are That's retiring great. sort of mattering circles where they can also talk about, you know, locating genuine needs in the world and how they can locate their strengths because a lot of people don't know. A lot of people, I think, don't know that they matter because they don't know what their natural strengths are. We actually, on our website, thematteringmovement.com, we have a uh, a link to what's known as the VIA Character Survey. I did mine. Yeah. I thought you it was see it? great. It's terrific. I did it. So it's yeah. a free survey. Yeah. It's a free tool mm-hmm. that was created mm-hmm. by Marty Seligman and Christopher Peterson, two of the yeah. leading you know, grandfather Sal- Seligman is um, the positive psychology exactly. movement. As right? is, it's great. As is Chris, yeah. Christopher Peterson. At, um, yeah, he's passed away now, but he was at the University of Michigan, and also dozens of scientists created this survey um, that's been administered all over the world to thousands and thousands of people, and it's free. And you can go on there. They ask you your questions, and then they identify your core strengths. And they also have a survey for young people. So I do this also with my children and you can see what your natural strengths are. And then a parent's job is to help a child see those strengths and try to match them to the needs in the world. Oh, you're, you know, for example, my daughter, you know, is very concerned. We live in New York city and the homeless population is, is their large and she, it concerns her. And so she wants to help them. She feels like, you know, it's very easy to just walk by homeless people because there are so many of them. She wants to tell their individual stories and she is a great storyteller. And I said, what a wonderful thing for you to do because you are a great storyteller and what a great way to use that to, to help this vulnerable population feel seen it's beautiful. and that they matter. Mm-hmm. So anyway, that's mm-hmm. just one example. It's a, it's a great example uh, because not only is she putting to use her own skill set, but in an area where then she can elevate the visibility 
of people who are often invisible in our population, as much as many people are doing lots of amazing things to help the unhoused. And at the same time, it's a growing population from COVID, but also just in general, because we haven't addressed it properly. And it's hard. LA is the same way. It's a really challenging problem. And also the lack of mental health services. So it's a whole, you know, there's a whole, it's never just one issue alone. But I love that. And I love that people can go on your website, take this survey for the kids as well as adults, and then really seeing, is it matched to what I naturally do? Are there other ways that I can think about my strengths, matching it to a needs that are out there? And the other thing I want to highlight that you said a couple times, which I really love and appreciate, is you use the word genuine. And I want to highlight that because I think that when you give this amazing advice, like, you know, tell the woman in, who, who serves you lunch that um, you appreciate her, that I believe it has to come from a genuine place. Don't just do it because that's going to help you get out of your, you know, stuck place or feel it will. However, and sometimes you have to practice stuff before it really innately or intrinsically becomes part of who you are. But genuinely understand that you're doing this because you do appreciate what someone else is doing, or you could appreciate the situation that they're in, even if you're not in it yourself. Uh, And so I love that because I think being genuine about it adds to your mattering bank even a little bit more, right? It's just amazing. I, I truly, truly am moved by what you're doing. I am, um, you're so accomplished in your own right in a, in, as you, you know, we're changing the word of ambition, accomplished for the benefit of those of us who get to read your work and learn from your interviews and the focus that you have. And you have changed your own home life. And I believe you will be changing other people's as well. You certainly have uh, already changed mine as I ask myself, does this really matter? And can I, and there are times when I feel like deciding to let something go for the better of the relationship, as long as I don't harbor it, is really significant for me. Because what really matters in that context is, am I seeing where the other person is and who they are in this situation? And then can I see myself as well? So I, I just, I think it's beautiful. And I think it's has its own degree of magic, frankly. The one thing you said is, that I love to, among many other things, is that this can be taught and it can be practiced. And what a gift. Um, many of us sort of take a back seat and say, well, they're really talented in this area or they're really good, that everybody has a uniqueness and everybody has a talent and everybody has gifts. And so it's just thinking about matching those to a need that's out there. Yes. And I think that's um, that shows that we all matter and we all have the capacity to matter. And part of it is a little appreciation for others and ourselves goes a long way. Sometimes we're hard on ourselves, right? And then we're hard on our kids and we're hard on our youth. So uh, toward the end of our, of every podcast, we always have a, uh, a round of quick and gutsy questions. So if you are ready, I'm ready. Do it. So what is at the top of your wish list for the mattering movement? And the answer can't be money or funding, because I know it takes a lot of funding to put movements out there, but what is at the top of your wish list? Top of my wish list is for the word mattering to be understood and used in everyday conversation. And I love that it has historical roots, too. It has a lot of not only research behind it, but a lot of history that I think we haven't embraced to move forward. Yes. And it moves us maybe a little bit closer to a collectivist society versus an individualistic society. And I really appreciate that. If you were to think of a song that describes the mattering movement, what would it be? Um, It would be Carly Simon, Let the River Run. I love that. I love Carly Simon. I love Carly Simon. I do too. Boy, Let the dreamers take the nation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And talk about a someone who found her voice, literally found her voice and figuratively. Yeah, it was beautiful. It's great for women all over, too. What makes the mattering movement gutsy? You're gutsy. Mm-hmm. What makes the mattering movement gutsy? It's countercultural. You know, we are a 
We live in a hyper individualistic society that's hyper competitive, that has this zero sum mindset. And we are here to tell you that there's enough for everyone, that you are valued, that everyone is valued, and that, you know, to really matter means that you don't matter more than others and others don't matter more than you. So I think what, what's gutsy about us is, is that it, it makes perfect sense. Um, it's intuitive, but it is a bit countercultural. Yeah, it is. Brene Brown, who I love and I love her work, she talks a, a bit about, you know, what scarcity and mm-hmm. what's enough. And we have enough. We just don't believe we have enough. And yes. what is enough? And I love the whole concept of uh, having a mattering account, like a bank account. I love mm-hmm. that. It's going to be, mm-hmm. it's part of my mindset now. And I, uh, I think it's, yeah, it's terrific. I love it. What is something that outsiders or maybe even a few insiders don't know about the mattering movement? Maybe they don't know the reach of how, of how it's not just a, a never enough feeling. It's not just an American phenomenon, how, how universal the idea is. Yeah, I love that you said that because it also can be within different cultures, as long as you recognize and understand the culture, but it still exists there in a particular way, which I think is um, important for people to recognize that it's not just an American issue. So this next question feels a little bit weird and unfair given our whole conversation. So, but I think it's, or I should say, and I think it can still be important and you can decide if you want to answer it. If you could get one celebrity, when we talk about celebrity culture, but there are plenty of celebrities that have a voice or influencer to endorse or talk about the mattering movement, who might that be? Oh, it would be Oprah. And here's why. Because Oprah has written about and talked about how the first time she felt like she mattered was... Mrs. Duncan's class. I think it was. Yes, I remember this. Mm -hmm. And she brought Mrs. Duncan onto her show three times and she talks about mattering and she talks about its importance. I think that she would be an incredible person to have talk, you know, be the, the face of the mattering movement, because, um, you know, I think what we can show her is that mattering can be taught and spread. That's what I love so much, that it isn't something that either you have or you don't, or you experienced or you don't, but it's something that you can build upon and spread like a pebble in water. Once you begin doing it, as you said earlier in the podcast, you can't unsee. And those are gifts. When something is turned on that you can't turn off, it really does speak to I think the depth of what you've uncovered and are perpetuating and what you, it's a little bit of a calling for you, I'd say, at this point. Is that fair? Very much. Yeah. Very much. Yeah, I love that. So how do folks reach you? How do people get on board? How do people learn? You could head over to the matteringmovement.com. Um, we will be having, you know, tools and lecture series. The book Never Enough is the first commercial book to to really introduce the idea of mattering. So, you know, obviously I would suggest you get the book. And so you could hopefully it becomes on Oprah's basically. list too. <laughs> Sorry. Oh my God, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, putting a plug um, out there. Yeah. It would be awesome. And then we are going to be launching um, a community uh, around this. So we will be giving people tools, resources, and also a community where we can talk about mattering and give each other advice. Um, and that's what I love so much about mattering. You don't need a PhD to do it. You don't need a PhD to understand it. You do need to be taught how to find it, how to mine for it. And then how to pra- continue to practice it. Exactly. And I I think it, I, I just, I'm so excited by this. I really, um, I wish I had even dug a little deeper, even with my intro, because I really now have a, a deeper understanding. And I did go on your website and I did take the uh, inventory. I had done Strength Finders. I'm certified in MBTI, but I really loved this one. And so I encourage everyone to go on your website and at least um, take the uh, indicator or the, it's not really a test. It's just a question 
questions that really come to a point of where it explains a bit of how you answer the questions and you answer them as honestly as you can with your sort of intuitive sense of this is what I think or this is who I am. And I love that it's also for youth, that it's not limited and shouldn't be because if we can start with our youth really having them feel valued and seen and that they matter, it will over time change, I believe, change our society. Uh, And it starts with um, those of us who have that kind of influence and you're very much in the forefront of that. And so I so greatly appreciate everything that you're doing. And, um, And I really appreciate the time you spent with me. This Thank was you so great. Much. I love this. I love, I love this. Thank you for having such a rich, deep conversation about it. The reason I haven't read your book is it's not out yet. So yes. your book comes out in August. Yep, August 22nd. 22nd. I am going to be on the list to purchase because I think it'll be, so, I think, first of all, it'll be incredibly interesting. And I think your research, you are such, you are, I'm not a journalist. This is not part of the podcast. I always say that I'm a therapist by training and have moved into organization development work. But what I love is that you are a journalist. So you, you, you answer, you ask the tough questions. And in this context, you really not only looked for answers and threads, as you talked about, you looked for ways that we can replicate those threads you found that made a difference in our youth and can be applied to other aspects of society. And I love that. All of the Small and Gutsy episodes can be found on the Intrinsic Group website, which has a Small and Gutsy page. The opinions and viewpoints expressed by our guests are independent and do not reflect the position of Small and Gutsy. Of course, we can't take responsibility outside of our own vetting of the organizations we interview, so before you sign on to support or work for them, we encourage you to do your own due diligence and research them as well. We just want you to learn about the Small and Gutsy nonprofit and social impact organizational sector so they can spread their story and their impactful work. I want to thank my partners in this endeavor, the Intrinsic Group, my brilliant sound engineer and composer, Pavel Franson, my very talented graphic designer, Nate Addy. Please check out their bios on the Intrinsic website. My incredible board of directors, Tracy Brown, John Gatto, Lucy Mello, Serena Rajabian, who believed in me and this project enough so to sign on to support this effort and all of the folks, friends and family who have guided and inspired me. A very special thank you to my biggest champion, number one fan, and best friend, without whom none of this would be possible. Thanks, Mark Wickoff. Thanks for being there. And thank you for listening. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends, give us some stars, and write a review on wherever you listen to podcasts. From small and gutsy to big with impact, I'm Laura Wickoff. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.